Good evening, everyone. I wish each of you had the opportunity to have the view that one gets from up here. <laughs> you know, we're talking about Kriya Yoga, science of spiritual living for the modern age. Well, what more proof would anyone need than just the, the light and the goodness that shines from all of your faces? I mean that, Jai Guru. So you've had now the basic technique classes yesterday and today, the energization exercises, Hong Sa technique, Om technique. And so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about Kriya Yoga. And I think all of you realize, of course, Kriya Yoga is a specific technique which is given at the time of initiation, that sacred ceremony where the Gurus of SRF impart that technique to the devotee. And it's also a comprehensive science. And if we, if we can understand and keep in mind some of the basic principles of the comprehensive science, then it really helps a great deal in the practice of the specific techniques. And not just the Kriya technique, but all the techniques because all of them are part of this very, very interrelated science of meditation, science of yoga taught by our guru. Now, uh, Paramahansaji had a uh, description for what Kriya Yoga does, and he, he called it reversing the searchlights of the senses. That says a lot, just in a, in a phrase. And I want to read some of his words about this because they're so powerful and they completely set the stage for what we'll be talking about tonight. So he starts and says, The searchlights of our mind's attention and of the five senses ordinarily are focused on imperfect matter. So think of that, the powerful power of attention of our mind, and not just the mind, but all of our energy focused outward. That's the ordinary state of earthly consciousness. And then he goes on. Man's attachment to matter keeps the soul confined to the bodily prison and prevents it from finding freedom in God in the realm of eternal bliss. The ego attempts to satisfy through material channels the soul's constant insatiable longing for God. Think of that. The soul's constant insatiable longing for God. I think it's, it's fair to say that the very beginning of our progress on the spiritual path comes from the point when we realize, when we, when we feel, we begin to feel that longing. And what does the world, what does, what does all of the influences of that, that are surrounding us in the world today, it tends to try to drug that longing, to numb it, to cause it just to go away out of our consciousness by just constant distractions and constant attempts to substitute lesser things. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work, and you all know that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here tonight, isn't it? So our guru goes on, the ego attempts to satisfy through material channels the soul's constant insatiable longing for God. Far from accomplishing its objective, it increases our misery. The soul's hunger can never be appeased by indulgence of the senses. And now here comes the point. He says, when man realizes this and masters his ego, that is, when he achieves self-control, his life becomes glorified by the awareness of divine bliss even while living in the flesh. Even while he is still in the flesh. Then, instead of being the slave of material desires and appetites, man's attention is transferred to the heart of omnipresence, resting there forever with the hidden joy in everything. That is reversing the searchlight of the senses. That is Kriya Yoga. And you know, every time I read this, this particular passage, it, 
it just moves me. It gives me the same excitement, the same thrill as when I first read it in Lesson 93 40 years ago. Because really, I mean, who would not want their life to be glorified by divine bliss while still living in the body? You know, who would not want their attention to be attuned to the hidden joy in everything? You know, where do you sign up? <laughs> All right, well, somehow we found it. But it helps to look at a little bit of the science behind this, too, is that our guru explained the soul, which you have had glimpses of in your times of meditation in your, and also in your study of Guruji's teachings. The soul first comes into, into incarnation, into this fleshly body, at the time of conception, when the sperm and the ovum are united, and out of those two cells, it creates, you might say, like an astral portal that the, the soul can then incarnate in physical, in physical form. Now, the interesting thing is, is that even scientifically speaking, those, that initial primal cell then becomes the nucleus of the medulla oblongata at the base of the brain, and from that, the rudiments of the central nervous system. You read a book on anatomy, you'll find. Within days after conception, there's already this, what they call a neural groove that goes the whole length of the embryo. This is before there's any heart and kidneys and any muscles or any of that. The medulla and the spinal column. And then, as we look at it from the point of view of yoga, down that spinal column, the, the consciousness and the energy the awareness of the soul after the baby is born goes down that spine, out into the senses, out into the world, and it makes the soul, so to speak, fall asleep. Fall asleep. That's why we say, asleep in delusion. All right, it isn't all discouraging. <laughs> Don't get discouraged. I want to tell you a story. This was, this was shared with us by this gentleman, Dr. Omar Garrison, who uh, he appears in that uh, film that you've all seen, The Glimpses of a Life Divine, a uh, journalist who is a, a dear friend of our guru, Paramahansaji, and used to visit with him um, in the Encinitas Hermitage. And he told this story to the monks. And he said, one time when he was there in Encinitas, he said, we had a, a guest come. It was a gentleman from India. And he said, I won't say his name. And uh, he said, this man had come over from India with uh, Rabindranath Tagore some years earlier when Tagore won the Nobel Prize and was touring around in the, in the United States. And apparently, according to Dr. Garrison, this gentleman thought, well, I could stay here and become a teacher, become a yogi, become a great ascetic and renunciant, and it's a pretty good setup. So, and uh, he said, well, Paramahansaji, of course, knew everybody from the inside out. He said, but he loved everybody. So this, he said, this chap came to stay with us at the Hermitage. And he said the first night, um, he, uh, he wanted to make, a, you know, an impression of, about his uh, asceticism and his great renunciation. He said, never mind about breakfast. I, I only take orange juice. So, uh, but then Dr. Garrison said, then he would show up the next morning and lay waste to the table. <laughs> and then each evening after eating a very heavy dinner, they would go into the living room, into the drawing room there in the hermitage, and he would sit on the sofa and promptly fall asleep and start to snore. You know, imagine, you know, you're sitting there with, uh, with Paramahansa Yogananda and, <laughs> all right, <laughs> So one time this was happening, and, and he said, Yoganandaji looked at me, and he said, you know, here he is, snoring away, but I want to show you something. Someone's awake in there. And he went on, and he started talking about yoga philosophy, these very deep subjects, and then without even changing his voice, he just said, and she gave me $20,000. And right away, the man jumped up, <laughs> Swamiji, did you say $20,000? And Yogananda, with a big beaming smile, he said, You see, someone was awake. (laughs) 
The soul is always awake. We just have to restore our connection. We have to connect ourselves to that divine consciousness. And that, of course, that's the whole purpose of Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga gives us the way to make that connection, to restore our divine connection, and then ultimately find our oneness with God. Now, Paramahansa Ji said, Kriya is a very ancient science. This is one of the high yoga sciences from the higher ages in India. And as we know, many times great truths, great concepts from the higher ages are handed down through myths and stories. And I want to share one. This is one that Brother Anandamoy pointed out to us when he was talking with the monks. And it's the story of the Greek hero Theseus. This is the story of his encounter in the labyrinth, that maze-like prison in Crete. It was, it was made by King Minos in Crete, and the whole purpose of it was to house this half-man, half-bull monster, the Minotaur. And they said it was such an intricate maze, such, a, such a, an effective prison that the man who built it, after he built it, he almost couldn't even get out. So. This is, this is how effective it was. So, now King Minos had conquered Athens, and as a result of that, he had decreed that every year, seven each of the, the finest young men and young women of Athens needed to be sacrificed to this minotaur, to this monster. Well, Theseus at one point said, okay, I'm going to put a stop to this, and he resolved to confront the monster. So, he, he sailed to Crete. He got there, and First thing that happened was the daughter of King Minos, whose name was Ariadne, she was known as the mistress of the labyrinth. Well, right away she fell in love with Theseus. And so to give him a break, to give him a, a chance of surviving, she gave him this big ball of thread. And what did he do? He tied one end of the thread to the door and then made his way down into the into the depths of the labyrinth, unrolling the thread the whole way, and got down to the bottom where he confronted the Minotaur, overcame him, and now what? How, do I, how does he get out? Well, simple. He just followed the thread all the way through the winding passage the way back out to the door and to freedom. And everyone was amazed. You know, how did he get out? Well, it's the same with us. Same with us. That goddess of Maya sent us down into this labyrinth of the body of earthly life, this labyrinth which is just as complex or more complex than any physical maze with the branching and twisting pathways of our proliferating desires. Let's go this way, let's go that way, and how are we going to get out? Well, fortunately, Divine Mother also loves us. And when these bodies are created, she put that thread, she put that thread into the thread-like astral spine, which we call the sushumna. And all we have to do is find our way and follow that thread out to the door of the spiritual eye and out to freedom. Paramahansa Ji said, this is why he said about Kriya Yoga, no matter what your faith is, what your belief is, Kriya Yoga is the scientific highway to the infinite, for you will ascend the path by which your spirit descended into the flesh and became locked in the body. That is the purpose of Kriya Yoga. Kriya means action. Yoga means unity. Kriya Yoga means that action which brings unity of the descended soul with the spirit from which we descended. So one of the first blessings of Kriya practice is that it enables us to maintain that divine connection even while living in the material world. We don't have to go through life in a state of complete forgetfulness, complete obliviousness. Why? Because Kriya Yoga is the science of awakening the spine, awakening the spine. Another little story about this. There was a very sweet description of the ashram of one of the Indian saints, say about a hundred years ago. And in this ashram, there was an elderly devotee woman, and everybody called her Gopal's mother. 
Now, Gopal is one of the names of Lord Krishna when he was a child, Gopal. And this woman worshipped God in the form of Krishna with, with such devotion, with such love, that she actually, she talked with him and she saw him walking and playing and, and he would call her mother, mother. That was her whole sadhana, you know, great bhakti yogi, great, great devotee of, of Krishna. Well, one day there were two disciples in the ashrams and they were discussing about this Gopal's mother. And one of them, one of them advanced the opinion that, well, after all, you know, her experiences, they, they really belong in the transcendental realm. There's no way that Krishna was going to be right here on earth with her. And the guru, the guru was sitting in his room as, as these disciples were discoursing back and forth, he overheard. And so he called out from his room in a lovingly but somewhat sarcastic way, so now you're omniscient. You can discern what's going on here. And the disciples said, but, but Maharaj, but Guruji, how, how is it possible? How can one see God in this external world with the physical eyes? And the guru just looked at him and said, show me the line where matter ends and spirit begins. Show me the line where matter ends and spirit begins. Now, for years after I heard this story, I took the point of it to be that, well, we really shouldn't make a differentiation. We shouldn't make a hard and fast boundaries between our spiritual life and our life in the world. And of course, that's very true. That's, that's a basic principle of spiritual living. But as years went by, I began to think there's, there's really an, another message there. And it was this, that the guru wasn't saying that there is no line between matter and spirit. He was challenging the devotee to be aware of that line. And where is that line? Right in the center of our spine. Right in the center of the spine. Because he was saying, really, in effect, show me the line where our perception of matter ends and our perception of spirit begins. Where is it? In the spine. Show me the line where stress and fear and the outer chaos of the material world end and the peace and harmony and divine perception of the spiritual world begin. Where? In the spine. He said, show me the line where the compulsion of material desires ends and the fulfillment, the joy of our soul's desire begins. Where? In the spine. Remember, this is reversing the searchlights of the senses, back from the material perception, back gradually into the perception of that spiritual reality in the spine. So Guruji said this about Kriya. He said, the effect of Kriya is the magnetizing of the spine, converting it into this powerful magnet, magnetizing of the spine, by circulating the life currents up and down around the sensitive spinal cord, thereby withdrawing the life force temporarily from the sensory nerves and the involuntary organs and concentrating it in the spine and brain. And he said, when the yogi withdraws the life force into the subtle centers in the spine and brain by Kriya Yoga practice, he perceives God reigning there in all his glory and is blissfully aware of his own true soul nature, one with God. That's Kriya Yoga. So, first thing that, that we can look forward to as we make our way along the path of Kriya Yoga. First benefit, the first skill that, that starts to unfold is this gradual ability to maintain that divine connection, even, in the, even under outer activities. There's a second wonderful, wonderful benefit, wonderful purpose of Kriya Yoga, and that is this, that it gives us the ability to completely shut off the world in deep meditation. This, and then being able to rise above its, its negative influence by going so deep within that the world is shut off. This is what in yoga is referred to as interiorization or 
the fifth step on the Patanjali path, Pratyahara. Kriya and the other meditation techniques are a form of pranayama, life force control, which then produce this state of interiorization, Pratyahara. This, in today's world, really in any age of the world, this is a real survival skill, isn't it? One of my favorite of the CD recordings that we have of our late president, Sri Dayamata, is this one called Anchoring Your Life in God. And in that recording, Ma talks about this. And it, it, from the first time I heard it, it stuck with me, and I still get inspiration out of it. She said, when everything goes wrong in this world, Master used to say to us, when I don't like this world, when it gets too troublesome, I just turn it off. I switch it off, he says, and I'm lost in that divine consciousness. And then Ma says, well, I can only say this, that if it weren't for that, I don't think I could physically or mentally carry on. One must have that ability to switch it off, and that comes by self-training, by the training that we get in the daily practice of these powerful scientific techniques of meditation. Okay, here's a story I think you'll enjoy. It illustrates this. And this was, this was told by another of Master's close disciples, Miramata. She said that one time Master took the devotees who were living in Encinitas Ashram, took them down to this amusement park near Mission Beach, uh, there's an amusement park there, and he would take them there to see the fireworks on 4th of July. And uh, she said they, were, they arrived there, and they were supposed to meet some other people that were coming to be with Master's party from San Diego. And so they were, they were waiting, and Master, she said, picked up a wooden Coca-Cola crate and just turned it up and just sat down to wait for them. Well, it happened to be right underneath this huge this old-fashioned wooden roller coaster. It's still there, actually. I don't know if they've remodeled it, but it's, it's down there in Mission Beach. And she said, she said, you know what a racket that makes, the, the motor and the, the creaking and clacking, and, and she's a terrible racket, terrible racket. And so Miramai looked at the, the other disciple who was there and said, oh, you know, we can't let Master sit here in this noise. This isn't right. Let, let's go find a quiet place for him. So they went off and they found a more suitable place in their minds and they found some nice seats and, and so Mirama came back and, and said to Master, Sir, sir, come with, come with me. We found some very nice, uh, quiet place for you to sit. Well, you just sat there. So she tried again. She said, Sir, wouldn't you like to go where it's more quiet? I found these really great seats and we're holding them for you. Come along, I'll take you there. She said he just stiffened a little bit, just sat there. She tried a third time. And she said after the third time, she began to realize, well, some, probably there's something not quite right here. <laughs> so she went back to the other disciple and said, I can't even raise his attention. You know, he's not coming. Well, then on the way home, she said she was sitting there in the car in the back seat next to Gorgi, and he just looked at her and said, you, 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 you. I don't understand you. And she said, well, Master, what have I done wrong? He said, I was sitting there in that roar of the roller coaster, and it was turning into the roar of the universal cosmic motor. He said, I could hear the roar of all the atoms in creation, and Divine Mother was there. Oh, it was so beautiful. It was so marvelous. And you kept trying to pull me into your consciousness. <laughs> she said, well, sir, it was pretty noisy. <laughs> he said, learn the inner silence. Outer silence doesn't mean much. Learn to go within. Now, how to go within. How to go within. This is where Kriya, first part of the science of Kriya that I want to touch on now is Kriya is the science of the breath. Science of the breath. The science of breathlessness, really. Because as long as you've learned this, and probably uh, it was touched on in the, in the class on the Hong Sa technique, some of the other classes as well, 
As long as our breath is flowing in the body, so long are we in outer worldly sensory consciousness. The breath keeps us tied to the physical body. That's why in the Gita it says, at birth all creatures are immersed in delusion. That means with the first breath, the first breath that the, that the baby takes, right away the life force rushes out of the spine, into the nervous system, into the senses, and it just goes on, goes on forming that connection by which over a period of years that incarnate being becomes really a prisoner of matter, a prisoner of the body. So, that's why Guruji said, the ancient yogis discovered that the secret of cosmic consciousness is intimately linked with breath mastery. This is really a fascinating subject. Um, think, about this, think about this incident. I'm sure you've all read it many times. Remember when, when Guruji was in Calcutta and getting ready to come here to the United States. He, he'd already been invited to come to Boston to give that talk. And he, he was really worried. He said, as I went about my preparations to leave Master and my native land for the unknown shores of America, I experienced not a little trepidation. I had heard many stories about the materialistic West, a land very different from India, steeped in the centuried aura of saints. And he said, to dare the Western heirs, I thought, an Oriental teacher should be hardy beyond the trials of any Himalayan cold. Isn't that an interesting word, to dare the Western airs? And then it wasn't just an accident, because then later in the book, when he's getting ready to go back to India in 1935, and then he landed there and, the, and he said, gratefully, I was inhaling the blessed air of India. You know, these are not just poetic or metaphorical. There's a very, very important truth about this. Taramata, another great disciple of, of our guru, one time mentioned to the monks, she was giving some instruction and she said, remember, when you breathe, you inhale not only the oxygen, but the thoughts that are roaming in the ether. Isn't that interesting? Think about it. When we breathe, we're taking in oxygen because oxygen is a carrier of prana. Prana is not just energy. Prana has intelligence, which means it carries information. You know, how important, how, how what a vital thing this is that we are completely not aware of is that particularly in these modern times, you know, where we're just awash in information and what kind of information? You know, you look at what comes at us through advertising, through movies, through music, through all these things. And this is the, this is the vibratory, this is the energetic environment in which we live. And as long as we're in body consciousness, Guruji tells us, as long as we're in body consciousness, we're absorbing that, not only through the eyes and the ears and the other senses, but by the very act of breathing. Now, don't get panicky. It'll just make you start breathing faster. So, <laughs> Don't panic and just think, well, every time I'm in a materialistic environment, I'm breathing in poison. No, it's not quite so black and white. We can spiritualize what we take in, what we inhale from our, from our senses, but also th through our breath. If we tune ourselves to the spiritual vibrations, the presence of God, the presence, the presence of Guru, the, the presence of beauty and, and truth, all of these are just as present in the environment if we tune ourselves to them. The mantras, Hong and Sa, greatly spiritualize the act of breathing. So does practicing the presence of God. It tunes us to the higher vibrations. And let's just try this simple exercise that you can, we can practice right now. So sit up and close your eyes. And very simply, just feel, feel attuned to that, to that vibration of, of the presence of God that surrounds you. It's omnipresent. And uh, when the, as you breathe in, you just, th you just say to yourself, Thou art in me. And as you breathe out, 
exhaling into that surrounding presence, into that surrounding protection and divinity, I am in thee. Breathe in, thou art in me. Breathe out, I am in thee. Thou art in me, I am in thee. This is a powerful way of spiritualizing the environment and the act of breathing. Something that you can, can do whenever, you know, you have to take a little just time out and break and regroup and recenter in the midst of all the craziness that happens in all of our lives. But aside from those things, practicing the presence and the other techniques, most of all, most of all, is the long and deep practice of Kriya Yoga. Because Kriya, as I'm sure you've all read in that chapter in Autobiography of a Yogi, Kriya, over the years, as we go deeper and deeper, will enable us to attain without any holding of the breath, without any strain or forcing it to attain a state of complete, calm, peaceful breathlessness. And the point is that even a few seconds, even a few moments in that inner stillness, and even before we reach that state of, of complete breathlessness, even just entering into that calmness and that stillness, just for a few moments, it changes us. And it gives us a powerful immunity to whatever environment we find ourselves in. Now, it's easy to think probably the breathless state, you know, come on, you know, that's, that's way beyond where, where I feel myself to be. Uh, you know, when you're standing at the bottom of a tall staircase, you don't feel discouraged or you don't feel like I can never get up to the top just because you can't leap all in one bound up to the top of the stairs. You look at those stairs and you say, yeah, I can. these are doable steps. One, two, three. Well, this is what our guru has blessed us with. This system of meditation, this system of techniques that are step by step by step. And if we practice over the years, you know, one thing that happens is that when you receive initiation in Kriya Yoga, you realize how powerful a preparation were all of the little details that came starting with the very, very basic instruction of meditation. You know, think about it. Here's, for example, you know, we, learned to, we first sit to learn to meditate, relax the body. That's the first step in reversing the searchlights of the senses. We learn that 20-20-20 breathing exercise, calming the breath, diminishing the restlessness of the breath. Very important, right? the habit of concentrating, which we learn right in the beginning of meditation, concentrating at the kutashta, at the spiritual eye, the point between the eyebrows. Very important in Kriya, which we'll talk about it in a minute. Then the gradual, ever-deepening relaxation from the body, from the muscles, from the senses. From the muscles, we learn that with the practice of the energization exercises. And from the senses, gradually from the practice of Hongsa, practice of, of the, those other basic techniques of meditation. Another one, the power to, by the power of mind, the power of will to direct the life force in the body. Absolutely essential for Kriya, and that's what we are taught in the very first technique we learn, the energization exercises. So the point is, is that to get this blessing of Kriya Yoga, to get the blessings of these states that it, that it attains, sometimes it's, it's very good to remind ourselves to go back to the beginning. Go back to the basics. I can't tell you how many times during my years on the path I've done just that, gone back, start over with the basics. It doesn't mean that you're back to square one, that you haven't gotten anywhere. It, what it means is that you are incorporating with greater concentration, with greater power, all of those scientific aspects that make Kriya Yoga the most powerful technique of God-realization that's ever been given to man. In that same CD, Sri Dayamata, Anchoring Your Life in God, she said in such a moving way, I remember her tone of voice, where she said, in my early years of sadhana, I used to think to myself, if I use my time rightly now, 
If I get in the habit of practicing these techniques correctly now, then as the years go by, believing in what Master has taught and applying what he taught, surely those high states of consciousness about which he speaks can be mine also. Each technique, each skill that we learn as part of the techniques, all of these are part of the system of Kriya Yoga. If we use them all, then we will attain as Dhyamata, as all the great masters have attained. So Kriya, one aspect of the science that we've just talked about, science of breath. Now there's another part of the science that we also have to apply, that we will see as we get deeper into Kriya Yoga, that it is also not only science of breath, it's a science of war, inner war, inner battle. Because, you know, when it comes to living in the physical body, we have two choices. We can rule it, or we can become a prisoner of it. No other options. We can rule it, or gradually, but inevitably, we'll become a prisoner in it. In other words, we choose. Am I going to be a victim, or am I going to be a warrior? That's why the Bhagavad Gita urges the devotee to take up this spiritual inner warfare, inner combat, and extols Kriya Yoga as the supreme way to victory, supreme way to, to winning the inner battle, winning the inner war. And he tells Arjuna, O oh, scorcher of foes, arise, use your fiery will. In other words, lift yourself from the sense prison to the higher states of consciousness in the spinal centers. I love that epithet, that description, of that name for Arjuna, scorcher of foes. That's what, in one sense, what each of us has to become, to scorch those degrading ego tendencies and material desires that keep us a prisoner in the body. You know, some may be thinking, well, this sounds pretty militaristic. <laughs> and are, aren't we supposed to be uh, peaceful yogis, nonviolence, you know? Uh, and don't these kinds of attitudes sort of create like a vibration in you that causes uh, conflict and war and violence? I mean, there's so much of that in the world today. Well, yes, there is. Absolutely, our inner attitude has to take that into account. But we can never forget. Do you know the reason why? There are outer wars among humanity. It's because people are not willing to fight the inner war. Or they don't know the way to do so. Because as one writer observed, if people recognize no force superior to their desires, then they must fight when their desires collide. If people recognize no force superior to their desires, then they must fight when their desires collide. There's a lot of truth to that. A lot of truth to that. So we ask ourselves, what force? What force can we access that's superior to all of those gripping, compelling, incarnations, aged, material desires? What force could be superior to that? the force of the current of life force in the spine. Another story in Greek mythology. We find the story of the 12 labors of Hercules. And interestingly, all, all of these myths, they, they come down from, from higher ages of civilization. And they esoterically understood they all represent some aspect of the, of the spiritual path. And, this one in particular, this was the fifth labor of Hercules, and that was he had to clean these Augean stables. Maybe this famous story, I don't know if you, if you remember it or not, but the Augean stables, there were 3,000 cattle that lived there, and they hadn't been cleaned in 30 years. <laughs> and the task was he had to clean them in one day. 
Well, he, he, Hercules, I mean, he, he was up to the task. He looked around. He saw that the stables were on this piece of land, and there happened to be two rivers flowing uh, on one side of the piece of land, another on the other, on the other side of the land. And so he said, all right, I'll do it. I'll do, I accept the challenge. I'll do it in one day. And what did he do? He dug these ditches and these canals, and he took those two rivers and dammed them up and focused them and channeled them right through the stables and then let those the combined force of those two rivers rush through the stables, and boom, it was clean one day. Okay, now the symbolism. Yoga, yoga talks about how we are encased in body consciousness. And again, it goes back to the science of breath. The other aspect of breath is that alongside that spinal channel, the channel of the astral spine where those centers of divine consciousness are waiting for our discovery, alongside that spine, there are two astral channels called Ida and Pingala. And those are where the currents flow that make us breathe. You know, Gurji gave us this, this beautiful yogic chant. I don't know if, you, if you've chanted this one. Look it up in Cosmic Chants. It says, Why, O mind, wanderest thou? Go into thine inner home. On the left, Ida. On the right, Pingala. In the middle, the taintless Sushumna. Seize, seize her with all thy might. That's what Kriya Yoga, that's what the yogi is doing. Because as long as the breath is flowing, we're in those external channels. By Kriya Yoga, by the practice of the technique which is given initiation, long and deep, this takes time, but that magnet that we talked about earlier, magnetizing the spine, pulls those currents from, the, from those two superficial channels pours it through the spiritual eye into the deeper spine, into the sushumna. Now, what happens when we have that experience? First of all, that current flowing in the sushumna is more blissful, more satisfying, more attractive, more tempting than any material desire, anything that the world and the senses can bestow. And not only that, but that current Guruji said, will wash away countless incarnations of wrong vibrations, of ignorant thoughts and actions, and the residual karma that has been built up. We've got to get that current, relax it from the muscles, deeper and deeper, and then by Guru's grace, by Guru's blessing, we don't even have to understand the intricate astral and yogic physiology about it. If we just practice the technique, this is what happens, and then we begin gradually to feel. And even before we feel, that cleansing, that washing is taking place. This isn't also just a metaphor. You know, even now science is talking about this. We, we hear in so many of the research studies that, uh, that come about these days about this um, way that meditation can actually rewire the brain. And just here's one sentence that I pulled from one article of a, a researcher who's very prominent in this field of, of neuroscience. And he said, they have found it's, it is possible, it is possible to use different forms of energy to modify the patterns of the brain's electrical signals and then its structure. Its structure. Can you believe it? There were modifying the very structure of the brain by this concentrated, focused application of spiritual energies. Well, Gurji was, was way ahead of all of this. He maybe didn't have the same vocabulary, but he was pretty close. And he told this great story about how he said one time this, um, in India, this man came to him who was terrible, terrible anger addict, terrible temper, and he came to Master for help. And, and Gurji said to him, well, look, when somebody riles you up, when somebody gets you and you're about to lose your temper, just stop. Just stop and count to 100, and you'll calm down. Well, he came back about a week later and said, it doesn't work. 
that I'm sitting there counting, and I'm getting even more furious because I have to wait so long. <laughs> so then Guruji said, then I, then I told him to practice Kriya Yoga. And I said, after practicing your Kriya, this is for all of us, after practicing your Kriya, think that the divine light is going into your brain, soothing it, calming your nerves, calming your emotions, wiping away all anger, and one day your temper tantrums will be gone. And he said, not long after that, he came to me again, and this time he said, I am free from the habit of anger. I am so thankful. I'm so thankful. Guruji said one time, he said, so many people are psychological antiques. Year after year, they have the same tendencies, the same faults. But divine people, he said, change every day. Every day they try to change something that is not good in their nature. He said, if you meditate sincerely and deeply and try to send the current into the brain cells, you will be born a second time. Only the life current can change your life. Only the life current can change your life. And when you destroy those millions of records of incarnations of wrong behavior, wrong habits, wrong thoughts, then you are free. Then you are born again. So coming to the end of the discussion, what have we learned so far tonight? Enjoy the roller coaster. <laughs> Hang on by a thread. And for Pete's sake, clean out those stables. <laughs> You know, there's, there's so much about this, this subject of Kriya Yoga, and I really am just touching on a few of the highlights. But in our past convocations, we've had some wonderful other presentations about it. And a few years ago, we had uh, the 150th anniversary of Kriya Yoga, this special issue of Self-Realization Magazine, beautiful compendium of, of um, inspiration and information. So, uh, you know, if, if any of what we've been talking about tonight has piqued your interest, then this is a good place to go deeper into it. But I want to conclude with just one more point, one more aspect of the science of Kriya Yoga. We've talked about how we need to learn Kriya as the science of breath. We mentioned about learning Kriya as the science of war, inner spiritual warfare. And then third, we have to learn that Kriya is the science of love, the science of divine love. Because, you know, think about it. Why, why love? Why? It doesn't sound very scientific. What does love have to do with, with science? Well, think about what you feel when, you're, when you deeply love someone. You want to be near them. You feel a constant pull towards them. They're constantly in your thoughts. And love, Gurji says, in the universal sense, that force of love is what gravitates us, what pulls us back to our source, back to our creator. You know, this sounds very poetic, but it's actually a very precise, a very scientific description of what's going on with those subtle currents in the spine. Pulling the life and consciousness when we practice Kriya deeply, pulling the life and the consciousness first away from the muscles and the senses as we relax and let ourselves move deeper and deeper into that interior state, pulling the life and consciousness away from the senses, then into the spine, then into the spiritual eye, then into the om, and then into Christ consciousness, and then into cosmic consciousness. That's the power of gravitation. That's the power of love that we are tapping into, that we're awakening within ourselves by long and deep practice of Kriya. It's not a cold science. It's a loving science. It's the science of divine love. So if I could just leave you with one thought, one suggestion about what it takes to succeed in Kriya, it would be three things. You have to want God. Did I say one thing? Three things. <laughs> All right. Well, bear with me. You have to want God. 
You have to want God, and you have to want God. <laughs> you have to want God. You have to want God, and you have to want God. <laughs> That's it. Draw on that soul's constant, insatiable yearning, longing for God. As Gurdjie says in the autobiography, that intense craving begins to pull at God with an irresistible force. The Lord, as the cosmic vision, is drawn by that magnetic ardor into the seeker's range of consciousness. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that powerful? It's not as though we have to keep climbing and climbing on this ladder all the way up to the, the spiritual heights, but by that magnetic ardor, God is drawn into our range of consciousness. All we have to do is be ready for it. All we have to do is make ourselves receptive. All we have to do is to be one of the Kriya yogis that inwardly, constantly prays this beautiful prayer that Master put in poetic form. So just close your eyes and listen to this. This is what it means to be a Kriya yogi in the modern world. He said, breathe in me the way to love you, that I may learn to faultlessly love you. Pour me the wisdom wine by which I become intoxicated with you. Whisper in my ears of silence the way to be with you always. Speak to my wandering senses and lead them back to your sanctuary within. Call the marauding mind and counsel it how to retrace its steps to your home. And with your silent eyes, just look at me and I will know where to find you. See those eyes, those beautiful eyes of the guru when you look into the spiritual eye. See them, as he said, peering at you through the darkness, what appears to be darkness when we first close our eyes and look there in between the eyebrows. Visualize those wise and loving, omniscient, silent eyes. Because as Swami Sri Yukteswar, Master's guru, blessed him before he came to the, to the West, before he came to America, he said, all those who come to you with faith, seeking God, will be helped. All those who come to you with faith, seeking God, will be helped. As you look at them, the spiritual current emanating from your eyes will enter their brains and change their material habits, making them more God-conscious. As you gaze into those silent eyes, those beautiful eyes gazing at us in meditation, feel that divine pranic current, that divine vibratory current, purifying, spiritualizing the brain cells and our whole being. So in conclusion, the greatest truth, greatest truth about Kriya was said by Lahari Mahashai, father of Kriya Yoga, and that is this, that its power lies in practice. We can discourse about it, we can read about it, we can tell lots of interesting stories about it, but it all comes down to we will know its power by practice, day after day, year after year, not thinking how long it takes, but building that current, building that divine magnet in the spine, building that connection with God and Guru. This knowledge of Kriya is so sacred. It's so, it's so holy. And we should never, never forget or minimize the magnitude of what we've been given in this technique. Use it to maintain our divine connection as we live in the world. Use it first to lift the consciousness above the world, to shut it off at will by that 
pratyahara, by that interiorization. And second, to change by that purifying pranic current, to change what is of the world in ourselves. And lastly, thereby to become an agent of spiritual light, spiritual transformation in the world at large. That is tonight's message to you from the avatar of yoga for the coming world civilization. Jai Guru.